sang the song already, so it's, I hope it's still ringing in your head a little bit. Dare to be a Daniel. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And, and, the, and the application that you and I took home from that is, you and I need to have that same kind of heart. Say, you know what, I'm going to stand up and do what's right, even though that much pressure may be brought against me, though there may be negative consequences to me for doing what's right. But I'm going to look at the life of Daniel and of his three friends, and I see that their, their courage and their faith in God and their commitment to not polluting themselves, not defiling themselves, their commitment to doing what is right and what's holy, and that we need that same kind of internal fortitude about our faith and about doing what's right, and so dare to be a Daniel. Uh, while our focus last week was on Daniel, one of the things that you probably noticed as you read Daniel chapter 1 to 4 in particular is it also features another character. Uh, it features Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is a big, big character in, in the book of Daniel. Daniel looms large as the righteous man, and on the other part, there's this antithesis to him. It's Nebuchadnezzar, and we know, we know a lot about him. We know, for example, um, that he was the Babylonian king. Uh, he ruthlessly conquered the known world. He was an idol worshiper. He was an incredibly proud man, so proud that he had an idol covered in gold, 90 feet tall, built, and demanded that all of his citizens bow down and worship to it. He had a bit of a temper when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we're not bowing down to that thing. Uh, he flipped out, had, the, had a big fire built, and heated it as hot as it could get. Uh, sacrifice his own soldiers in an effort to get rid of these men. Uh, and then he had a surprise because God actually sent an angel to deliver them. He built um, the city of Babylon, considered to be an unconquerable city, with double walls uh, separated by a dry moat in between them. But the walls were so thick, they were 27 feet thick, you could race horses around the outside of the walls. Uh, there's the famed Ishtar Gate, uh, which... Uh, What's his name? Saddam Hussein uh, rebuilt a little mock-up of. There is uh, the ziggurat that was there. There's the famed uh, hanging gardens known as this, one of the seven wonders of the world. That was all Nebuchadnezzar's doing. That was part of his ambitious building programs. And he was ulti ultimately a man who was filled with pride. He was also one who was used by God because God, uh, actually when God, he was without even knowing it, he, uh, he did God's will. When he, he conquered Tyre, that was to fulfill prophecy. When he went down into Egypt, that was to fulfill prophecy. Uh, his taking of Jerusalem was by God's design. And so he, he's, a, he's a central figure in the scriptures. Now one thing that probably will surprise you is after I said all these things about him, and, and, he, and like Manasseh, when Elori read 2 Chronicles 33 this morning, Manasseh was a really bad guy. You remember that, right? Sacrifice his own sons in the fire, sorcery, witchcraft, divination, filled the streets of Jerusalem with blood. And you would think when you read about Manasseh's bio, you think there's no hope for a guy like that. And yet you saw that Manasseh actually became a follower of God. Well, the same thing is true of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 4, I find it a most fascinating passage because it's the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is the author of Daniel 4, it's his story of how he becomes a follower of God. He's kind of a high-profile conversion, if you want to say that. Uh, I find it very hard to, when I, when, I read, when I read Daniel 4, and when you read Daniel 4, ask yourself this question. Could a, could a non-believer say what's being said? Uh, or are these the words of a person that understands in their heart who God is and, and what his requirements are? And so... My, my uh, premise to you today is that, in the next slide please, Scott, uh, is that Channel 4 is about Nebuchadnezzar telling us how he became a follower of God. Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar, it's his testimony, it's his story of how he comes to follow God. And so follow along with me in Daniel chapter 4. And he in fact writes this letter and sends it out to his, all the citizens of his empire. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world, may you greatly prosper. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. That's quite an opening from a king, isn't it? It's, he, he sends out this letter to everybody in his, in his entire empire and says, you know, I want to tell you how awesome God is. This is his testimony. 
How great are God's signs and his mighty wonders. God's kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. And then he tells a little bit of backstory. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. And I had a dream that made me afraid. And as I was lying in my bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. And so I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. Now when the magicians and enchanters and astrologers and diviners, all these people were on his staff, they all came and I told them the dream, but they couldn't interpret for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, the key character of, in the book of Daniel. And I told him my dream. Now, he's called Belshazzar because at the very beginning, when Daniel was taken captive, he had him renamed after the gods that he had served. Um, he's called Belshazzar after the name of my god, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. And I said, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here's my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions that I saw while lying in my bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land, and its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth, and its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. And under it the beasts of the field found shelter, and the birds of the air lived in its branches, from it, and from it every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in my bed, I looked, and there before me was a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven. And he called in a loud voice, Cut down the tree, trim off its branches, strip off its leaves, scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but let the stump and its roots, bound with iron and bronze, remain in the ground and the grass of the field. And then let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, and let him be given the mind of an animal until seven times or seven years pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone that he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of men. There's a little self-confession. Nebuchadnezzar, who once strode the earth as the mighty king, he actually says, you know what, there's a little, little reference. I'm actually not as great as I thought I was. God gives it to whoever he wants, even to the lowliest of men he lifts up. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, also called Belshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. And so the king said, Belshazzar, don't let the dream or its meaning alarm you. It's kind of interesting. There's a little bit of tenderness there, isn't it? Daniel's freaked out about the dream, and, and the king says, hey, don't, don't worry about it. It's good. Just go ahead and tell me what it means. And so Belshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries... The tree that you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with its beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, and providing for food for all, giving shelter to the beasts of the field, and having nesting places in the branches for the birds of the air. You, O king, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky, and your dominion, it extends to the distant parts of the earth. You, O king, you saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven, saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live like the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. Here's the interpretation, O king. This is the decree that the Most High has issued against my lord the king. You, you will be driven away from people. And you'll live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. And seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men. And he gives them to whoever he wishes. The command now to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom it actually will be restored to you when you acknowledge that the heaven rules. Therefore, O king, be pleased... And this is kind of neat. Daniel's really bold, isn't he? He doesn't shy away from 
saying what he needs to say. He says, therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and renounce your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. And it may be then that your prosperity will continue. Now all this happened, verse 28, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, a whole year passes, nothing happens. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is this not the great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The words were still on his lips when a voice came down from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken away from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from the people, and he ate grass like a cow. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. And then at the end of that time, and here's, this is Nebuchadnezzar's writing. He's, he's the writer. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. And then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. This is what Nebuchadnezzar is saying about God. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles, they sought me out, and I was restored to my throne, and I became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, I praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven, because everything that he does is right, and all of his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he's able to humble. This is Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. This is his story, and I propose to you, it's his story of how he actually becomes a follower of God. Nebuchadnezzar, and, and the neat thing is, is, you know, he's not, he doesn't send out a sanitized version of, the, of a letter to, the, to, his, to his subjects. He sends out the whole story. The whole story that details his faults and his sins and his waywardness and his rebellion. And he's just out there with it and says, this is what happened to me. This is the journey that I was on. And this is how I came to the place where I am today. And this is what I want to tell you about God. It's an unapologetic witness for God in an, in an empire that he had founded and built by God's allowance, obviously, uh, built on all the idols of all that. And he says, look, he says, it's really this, it's God is the one who our focus and our attention needs to be on. He, his is the eternal kingdom. He's the one worthy of glory and worship and praise. Amazing words from, a, from the king of Babylon. And, and words not just said in the privacy of his own court amongst three people, but bold enough to say, you know what, get your printing presses going. I'm sending out a letter to my subjects because I want them to know how awesome God is. And I, direct, I want them to direct their praise to the one who has dominion over all things. And so that's, that's the premise of Daniel 4. Uh, but there's a couple points I want to share from you that I, I kind of gleaned from the text as I thought about this. First of all, um, it, this text illustrates that no one is beyond the grace and mercy and love of God. When Elori read, um, read to you from 2 Chronicles 33, and, you know, if you just stop the story of, of Manasseh, you know, he, he sacrifices his own children, he practices witchcraft and divination, he has innocent people murdered in the streets, he's a bloody, violent man. And you would think to yourself, there's no way that guy's ever going to heaven. And yet, when you read by the end of the, the, end of the account of his life, he's actually brought to the point of being humbled by God. God hears his prayer, and as a mark of true conversion and repentance, what does he do when he gets back home? He throws all the idols out of the temple. He cleans the place up. He, 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 he encourages the people to worship and follow God. It's, it's a mark of, of true repentance. Here we have Nebuchadnezzar, 
who it was all about himself. When you read chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, it's all about Nebuchadnezzar and how awesome he thinks he is. And yet, by the time we come to the closure on, on what we have of his life in the scriptures, he's talking all about God and not about himself. It's no longer about him and his might or his glory. It's, you know what, I want to tell you about how awesome God is. It's kind of an indicator of a change of heart and, and, and something of a transformational work of God. We also think, when we think about the point of no one being beyond God's grace and mercy, think about Paul. Listen to his testimony. His testimony is in 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 12 to 17. Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Paul's pumped about the fact that he got called into God's kingdom to serve him. Even though, this is what Paul says, one time I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, I was a violent man. And yet I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out upon me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And this is Paul's testimony, of whom I am the worst. He regarded himself as the worst of sinners. He says, Jesus came into the world to save people and he saved me. Here's my story. I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man, and yet I wasn't beyond the grace and mercy and love of God. God brought me into his kingdom that I, could, that I might serve him. But for that very reason, that I, of whom I'm the worst, but that for a reason I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ might display his unlimited patience as an example of those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. And here's a little throwback saying that kind of reminds me of Daniel 4. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and honor forever and ever. It almost sounds like Nebuchadnezzar's testimony, doesn't it? Nebuchadnezzar, this great, these great words of praise and adoration for God, and that's how he finishes his account. And here's Paul, kind of similarly, saying the very same things. And so when we think about it, no one, no one is beyond the grace and mercy and love of God. It doesn't matter what a person has done if they would truly humble themselves before him and turn in faith to Christ, the, the grace and mercy of God is available to forgive them. God will forgive anyone who humbles himself before him and puts their faith in Jesus. That's the amazing message of the gospel. You know, heaven is not populated by a whole bunch of people who are trying to do good. Heaven is, is filled, the halls of heaven are filled with sinners saved by grace. No one deserves to go there. We're all, the, anyone who gets to heaven is a sinner saved by the grace and mercy of God. That's, and that's test, testament to the mercy, his mercy, which we, we go, we warn people of the judgment to come, but we also point them to the mercy of God who would forgive those who humble themselves. The second thing that I want to draw your attention to, uh, there's a very famous picture someone has sort of drawn in the last couple hundred years of what they think. Now, he put on a lot of muscle when he went out to the field. Um, is think about God's methods in bringing people into relationship with himself. They're surprising and they're varied. How a person, and, and the point is, is everyone who's a follower of Christ has a story about how they came, and came to faith in Christ. And so the question is, is, you know, we always, what does the Bible say? Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. That's in the New Testament about you and I always need to be prepared to talk to people. But part of our talking to people about um, our faith and hope in Christ is, is sharing our story of God's mercy in our lives, of how we've been brought into relationship with him. And here we've got Nebuchadnezzar and his, his journey to faith. It began with the conquest of Jerusalem and with the choice when his generals chose to bring Daniel and his three friends. That was obviously by God's arrangement that they ended up in his court. Uh, it, Nebuchadnezzar's journey to faith and involved dreams sent to him. The first challenge of Daniel chapter 1 is he has a dream and he refuses to tell his advisors what the dream is. And then he's introduced, but the, where did the dream come from? The dream came from God. And so it's part of his journey. Um, his journey to faith involved the miraculous after he threw that temper tantrum and had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown in the, in the furnace. And God sent the angel. There's a miracle that he witnessed with his own eyes. And that didn't make a big change because he then proceeded, he kept on. Uh, and then, and then here, part of his journey, he hears Daniel say explicitly to him, you need to turn from your sin. 
He says, that's your problem. You need to repent of the sin that's in your life. And Daniel wasn't afraid to say that. He, was, he wasn't afraid to, to speak bluntly to the core of the issue. Uh, his journey to faith involved seven years of insanity. Seven years of having no mental faculty whatsoever, living as an animal. And it kind of, one of my side thoughts on that was, they didn't treat people very well that had mental illness now, did they, back then? Uh, he was just unceremoniously booted out of the palace and lived outside for seven years. And then the strange thing is, is he regains his sanity and he's welcome back. But uh, it made me think, wow, they didn't really have much to help people that were maybe in need. Uh, but his journey, in order for, get, get, for God to get his attention, he experienced all those things. And the clincher was when God put him on his face, living like an animal for seven years. That's, that's his story. That's his journey. And you know what? He shares it freely. He sends out this letter and says, look, I want to tell you how amazing God is and why he's worthy of praise and worship. And I'm giving praise and worship from my lips, he says, to God. And yet we, we read of his story. And so the question is, if you're a follower of Christ, what is your story? Every Christian has a story of how God brought them into relationship with him. And, and, and sometimes it's, God uses some very surprising and varied methods of bringing people to that point where they're humble before him and they lift their eyes up to him in faith. And it's different for everybody how God does it. But that's, that's Nebuchadnezzar's story. That's his journey. And you have, if you're a follower of Christ, you have your own story about how, how, how you came to that point. And that, that one of the big points of this text is, and we can't ignore it, is God hates pride. That's, that's a big fault of Nebuchadnezzar's, isn't it? Um, the Bible says that pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs chapter 29, a man's pride brings him low, but a lowly spirit gains honor. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 21 says, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 23 verse 12, Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself, on the other hand, will be exalted. Think about Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's pride. He, he builds a 90-foot tall gold statue to honor himself, and yet... What does he come to learn? He comes to learn that God alone is worthy of praise. He wanted the statute so that he'd get praise, but what is his testimony? He says God's the only one worthy of worship and praise. He thought that the world that he conquered was his doing, his kingdom. And yet what is, comes out of his mouth in chapter 4? Words of praise for God's eternal kingdom. It's the dominion of God that he wants to talk about, not his kingdom anymore, but God's kingdom. He thought he was in control. He thought he was sovereign over, the, over events. And yet, what, is his, what was his journey? What was his testimony? God is actually the one who is sovereign over all things. God is in control. It's his world. It's his place. And God can do what he wants. And everything that he does is right. Those are the words out of the mouth of the king of Babylon. Everything that God does is just and right. He's the one who's got the whole world in his hands. He's sovereign. He thought he was powerful, and yet he learned that he was actually weak. When you spend seven years living like an animal, you realize that you're not as strong as you thought you were. Uh, he thought everything was, uh, he thought the, the city that he built would be an enduring testament to himself and his power. And yet, what does he come to realize? That, that everything crumbles that people make, but what God, God builds, it lasts forever. That's, that's the story of, of, ne of Nebuchadnezzar. From a position of pride, God humbles him, and then he realizes all the, and, and then, he, then he's ab all about exalting God. And so we always have to be on guard against pride. Um, there's a book by Jim Collins. I think it's called How the Mighty Fall. And it's an entire book written from, this guy's not a, not a Christian by any stretch. Uh, but he wrote a whole book about, he uses the word hubris. Hubris is pride. The hubris of companies leads to their destruction. And he detailed, like, I don't know if you ever heard of Zenith or any, or A&P or those places, those companies, some, some huge monster companies that, that dominated the global market at some point, and they're all gone. And so he studied them, and he, what did he find? That pride in business destroys a business. But, you know, pride in your own personal life will destroy you as well. 
Uh, pride always comes before a fall, and we need to be we need to be on guard against that. So whenever we start to think of, that we're we're great or something, we need to rem remind ourselves that really we're not that great. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, it talks about um, don't think too highly of yourself. Have so have a sober self-assessment, uh, and 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 when, and when we do find ourselves caught out there as you know, I'd put herself across as more than we are. We need to go to God and say, you know, I'm sorry for that, Lord. I, I don't want to be that person. I, I'm not, I know I'm not better than anyone. Please forgive me. Help me to be humble. Help me to actually be concerned about other people that I might be a benefit and blessing to them. And then the last point that I have is a mark of a true believer is heartfelt praise. One of the reasons, and I went on, uh, I thought I'd, I, I'd go online this week and I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go to the most conservative website I could find, uh, the Puritan Believers web board, uh, and say, what do they say about Nebuchadnezzar? And it was very fascinating reading all these pastors dialoguing back and forth. And actually, it was kind of neat. The kind of universal assessment on that web page was they wouldn't have any trouble baptizing him. <laughs> if he came and requested baptism, the general consensus on the board was, you know what? He gives all the marks of someone that's actually had a true transformation in his heart and life. And I find, when I read this text, you know, I, I, that's my conclusion, is that this, what he says is not just like some passing feeling uh, and, a, and a lesson learned that he's forgotten. That it, it's how it closes the account of Nebuchadnezzar's life. Nebuchadnezzar's life is recorded in the scriptures, his history. It closes with him praising God and it, and it certainly appears to be coming from his heart. And, and praise, a heartfelt praise is a mark of, of a Christian. So when we, when we gather to praise God and to sing, you know, the Bible commands that we lift up our voices in First Chronicles 16, verse 9, sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk, tell of all of his wondrous works. That's a command to us, that we actually lift up our voice. And so this is, this is the account of Daniel 4. I, I presented it to you today. It is the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar, his testimony of how he became a follower of God. Uh, and there's a point. The points are this. It, no one is beyond the grace and mercy of God. It's, think about the ways in which God brings people to himself. They're, they're surprising and varied, the journey that people are taken on to the place where they put their faith in, in God. There's, there's a praise that's required of us, and then there's the counsel that you and I need to be on guard. We aren't to think too highly of ourselves. We need to watch out for pride. And, you know, we need to remember that, you know what, if you're really, if you got a really, if you're really smart or you're, you're doing really financially well or whatever it may be, or you're experiencing successes and other people are, re are recognizing you for the talents you have, it's never about us. We always need to say, we always need to be ones to say, you know what, God has given me that. That's a blessing from God because every gift, every talent, every ability that you and I have, it's not our doing. It's a gift that God has given to us and, and, he, and we, need to, we need to stay focused and we need to stay humble. Let's stand to sing as we, as we close this morning.